So good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of LTI, I welcome you all for this uh, webinar on many Crusoe's Robinsonade in the 20th century. So before we move on to the program, I request the audience uh, to watch a prone clip of LTI. So here it is for you. Uh, thank you for uh, watching the prom clip of LTI. Uh, for the audience, I have a few uh, announcements. First is regarding your certificates. Uh, people who attend the programs, I mean the webinars from beginning till the end will get your certificates. Uh, due to some technical issues, some of you may not have received your certificates yet. So don't worry about that and we'll, uh, your honor, or, I mean, we'll be sending it to you as soon as possible. Uh, the second point is we have a chat facility uh, in, the, in, the, in the room where you can share your ideas and uh, questions during the question answer sessions uh, for the uh, for the speaker. So your questions should be taken and answered. Uh, and I request the audience not to share your uh, personal details like your phone numbers or emails on the chat. So uh, we have uh, Ms. Abhishekta. She is an associate pro I mean, professor of English, Institute of Engineering and Management. So she'll be the moderator. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. So without much delay, 
Let me introduce the speaker of the day. He is an eminent personality who is present um, among us today, Dr. Amrish Shin. So he is presently professor and former head, Department of English at Vishwabharati Shanti Niketan. He is interested in 18th century studies, travel writing, Tego studies, and the history of science. He has won the outstanding research award for his doctoral dissertation, The Narcissistic Mode, Metafiction as a Strategy in Maul Flanders, Tom Jones and Tristan Shandy, published in 2007. Some of his major publications and edited volumes include Gitanjali, The Centenary Edition, Rabindranath Tagore, The Unsung Hero, Sharing the Dreams, The Remarkable Women of Shantaniketan, Confluence of Minds, The Rabindranath Tagore and Patrick Gates Reader on Education and the Environment, The Scottish Enlightenment and the Bengal Renaissance, The Continuum of Ideas, and Shantaniketan for Visitors, and the Bengali chemist Acharya Pofula Chandra Ray and Postcoloniality, and Vasundhara Rabindranath Tagore and the Environment. He is the joint coordinator of the UJC UKIERY project on the Scotland India Continuum, Tagore and his circle, and the deputy coordinator of the UJC SAP project on Rabindranath Tagore, the East West Confluence at the Department of English. Apart from his academic engagements, he has also translated and performed in Tagore's dance dramas at national and international programs. He is presently also the joint editor of the Vishwabharati Quarterly. Among his major awards, he has won the research award by the UGC, the Oxford 18th century bursary and a host of academic uh, recognitions. He has traveled extensively as project coordinator for the UKI ERY award to Edinburgh, Scotland, as invited speaker to the University of Oxford and Twickenham, Tongji University, Shanghai, China, and has also delivered the Tagore Memorial Lecture at the Rabindranath Tagore Center under the Mahatma Gandhi Institute at Mauritius. Professor Amrish Sen is also presently officiating as the director of Granthana Bibhaga, the publication wing of Vishwa since 2018. So uh, with, uh, without any delay, I would like to uh, introduce the second moderator of the session. She is Ms. Uh, Ria Baroy. She is working as an assistant professor in Institute of Engineering and Management, Kolkata. So without much delay, I would like to call upon the stage or the virtual podium, Dr. Amrish Sen. Sir, are you present or uh, then we yes, can start? Yes, good afternoon. A very good Thank afternoon you, to you. Right. Thank you for the very kind introduction, Ovishikta. And uh, hello to everybody at ELTAI. Uh, thank you for allowing me this platform to share my ideas on a research area that I've been working on for several years now. Now, before I begin, I would like to uh, dedicate this lecture to the memory of uh, one of my teachers, a great scholar of English literature who passed away yesterday, Professor Shapon Kumar Chakraborty. Shapunda, as we knew him as, was a teacher at Presidency College, at Ramakrishna Mission, Narendrapur, and of course at Jadavpur University, where he founded the uh, as it were, with Shukantuda and uh, Shupriya Choudhury, the Center for Renaissance Studies. So this lecture is dedicated to his memory, my teacher, Professor Shapun Kumar Chakraborty. Right. Now, I have a small presentation for you so that uh, uh, we, we can keep within a, a certain uh, restricted uh, aspect of uh, discussion. And I have titled this many crusoes, the Robinson Aid in the 20th century. And I think this is an interesting text, primarily cutting across all ages. This is a story that we all have told our children, have listened to as children. Yet, the two texts of the 18th century that you normally talk to your children about and teach in your classes, Robinson Crusoe and Gulliver's Travels, with deadly serious literature in their own respective areas. But Robinson Crusoe has emerged as a text that has been translated in almost every single written language and is one of the most widely published and translated books after the Bible. So what exactly leads to its popularity and what is the Robinsonade, which carries on its legacy. Now, if you take a look at that, the term Robinsonade was coined in 1731. Remember, 
Defoe was published in uh, Defoe published Robinson Crusoe in 1719. This is exactly 302 years that we are reading this text. So Schnabel talks about the Robinsonade from 1731 onwards, and the Robinsonade is broadly described as a genre. It's spawned so many texts that it's become a genre in itself, which repeats the themes of Robinson Crusoe, usually you know, incorporating the castaway experience or the shipwreck experience, a tale of survival on an island, either lonely or in a group, and rewrites the uh, specific aspects of Crusoe's experience. And Crusoe's experience can be, as it were, divided into multiple ways. Uh, and that is a theme that I'll come to in a minute. Now, the Robinson actually sort of can be divided, subdivided into various kinds. Uh, I've just outlined two of them for you. The first is the archetypal Robinson Aid, the tale of survival, adjustment, and final rescue. And the other is the anti Robinson Aid, which brings out the political implications and the power dynamics of the Crusoe story, both in terms of colonialism as well as in terms of Crusoe's handling of nature. Because remember that not only does Crusoe colonize Friday, he also has an iron grip on the island. Therefore, the man-environment relationship, which is a very dominant theme in the eco-critical sort of perspectives of our times, is an important aspect of the power dynamics of Robinson Crusoe. So the archetypal Robinson and the anti-Robinsonade. These are two categories which I'll be using throughout the course of this lecture. So it was important for us to get the Robinsonade properly defined. Now, I framed a couple of research questions for myself so that I can stick to the time frame that has been provided to me. My first question is, what are the causes behind this perennial fascination with the Crusoe story, that it has emerged from the status of a narrative to the status of a myth. The second is, why has Robinson Crusoe attracted such great rewritings and adaptations? Remember, I'll be talking about at least two Nobel laureates in literature who've written spin-offs on the Robinson Crusoe myth. And I will, of course, remind you about J.M. Kutzia's 2003 Nobel acceptance speech, where he talk, talks about Robinson Crusoe and his man. Therefore, in certain ways, he enters into the domain of the Nobel Prize acceptance winning speech, as it were, as a kind of figure who is a perennial inspiration. The third is, how can these rewritings of Robinson Crusoe be related to the 20th century? And I, I, I admit here, I put a caveat out that the 20th century is a humongous period. So I'll be touching upon a few Robinsonates. Not all of them will be possible in this period of time, but I'll be talk, touching upon a few major signposts of the rewriting of the Robinsonade, and I'll interrogate why the Robinsonade was so important at that particular juncture of time in the 20th century. Remember that the 21st century has provided its own Robinsonades, but that is something which is probably for another day. Now, the other question that I need to answer is how has this differentiated between the 19th and the 20th centuries? I'm going to say in political ideologies, how has the Robinsonade varied between, say, within the 200 years of its you know, passing, as it were, and how it adjusts to the utopias and the dystopias of contemporary uh, or let's say the 20th century, because contemporary would mean the 21st. And finally, as a small sort of interjection, I would like to take a look at how India has re responded to the Robinson Aid. I'll get the chance to about only one small Bengali Robinson Aid, but that should be an interesting end to our conversation. What are the primary texts that I'm using here? Please remember that there are numerous 
Robin Sudeep. So I'm restricting myself to a few of these texts. Now, I have William Golding's Lord of the Flies, 1954 text. Remember, Golding won the Nobel Prize in 1983. Michael Tunis, this is a French text, by the way, Friday or the Other Island, published 1967. Uh, Jane Katsia's Four, 1986. Katsia, of course, won the Nobel Prize in 2003. And I have uh, three films which I'll discuss and touch upon very briefly. The first coming in 1932, almost, you know, in the first years of uh, films in Hollywood, Sutherland's Mr. Robinson Crusoe, Bunuel, the reputed Latin American filmmaker, Robinson Crusoe, the most faithful Crusoe, as it were, 1952. And while I take cognizance of Jack Gold's Man Friday, I will discuss a little uh, in little greater detail Rob Hardy and George T. Miller's Robinson Crusoe 1996, so at the end of the century, which has Pierce Brosnan, uh, whom you know also as James Bond, enacting the character of Robinson Crusoe. So this is a kind of a corpus of texts which I think should provide interesting insights into the way that the Robinson aid has functioned throughout these uh, 100 years. Now, uh, I am going to argue with Ian Watt that Robinson Crusoe, of all texts in literature, is probably the myth of our modernity. And I do not mean modernism, I mean modernity here. Right. And why does, you know, uh, Watt talk about Robinson Crusoe's modernity? You see, modernity is also defined as the point where possessive individualism enters into the philosophical terrain of the definition of the self. So uh, if we describe the Enlightenment and the Renaissance as the kind of early modern framing of the modern moment, then the characteristic aspirations of the Western man in terms of a triumph of human achievement and enterprise and uh, the formation of an elementary political economy is the reason that what suggests Robinson Crusoe is the Ur text, the basic text of Western modernity. Also, very importantly, comes this point, which Amitabh Ghosh in The Great Derangement talks about the moment of the Anthropocene in the way in which human activity was changing the Earth's atmosphere. And this happens in and around the early 1700s, that the literary imagination becomes focused solely on the human. And this individualizing imaginary is something that you know, Crusoe gleans, as it were, in his narrative. Right. The other thing, of course, is the way in which the man-nature relationship emerges with modernity, where Crusoe does not look at nature as a kind of a pantheist, but as somebody who will use and mold nature to his personal benefit. And this is something which we see as the hallmark of Western modern civilization. And also, this is, remember, ladies and gentlemen, the moment when uh, colonialism, which will be the dominant enterprise of Western man for over 200 years, takes its ship with the Crusoe Friday story, something many of you teach in your undergraduate texts. Now, of course, the theoretical framework in which Crusoe has been analyzed is, of course, the theory of myth. And I'll come to the myths which Robinson Crusoe embodies. The theory of intertextuality, something popularized by Julia Kristeva in terms of the, 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 the text as a mosaic of quotations with a process of absorption and transformation of texts. And Kristeva talks about the replacement of intersubjectivity with intertextuality, where desire play replaces the hegemony of the author, as it were. I'm also referring to the post-structuralist theory of intertextuality, the idea of playing around with the text, the jouchon, the idea of the jouchon that you know uh, Barth articulates, and of course Derrida's theory of the deconstruction of the paradigms of the uh, text, as it were. Now, of course, Robinson Crusoe 
creates utopias and dystopias on the island, a utopia for Western imperialism, a dystopia for the colonial, uh, colonized Friday, as it were. But the Robinson aid has strategically used the frameworks of the utopia and the dystopia. Now, one of the major things that all of you will have noticed, and you teach, I'm sure, in your uh, syllabus, is how Robinson Crusoe is a text that almost sort of erases the woman out of the equation at all. Uh, there's a wife of Robinson Crusoe, but she's a poor woman, relegated absolutely in the margins. It's an entirely patriarchal text. So the 20th century, of course, has answered these uh, erasures of gender and sexuality. So that's one, theatric, uh, one theoretical approach that has been brought in. Of course, the theory of post-colonialism and adaptation and appropriation make up the remaining uh, ways in which the Robinson aid has looked at the, the main text, as it were, in the, in the 18th century. Or I'm sorry, I should not have used the main text. There are just a series of texts floating around which respond and are in dialogic interaction with one another. Now, uh, if you take a look at the way in which Crusoe has been framed as myth, then you have, of course, Jean-Jacques Rousseau talking about Robinson Crusoe as the myth of the natural man, right? And he says that if Emil is marooned on an island, the only book that he will give her is Robinson Crusoe. Of course, you know, uh, Rousseau is mistaken here in the way that, you know, uh, Robinson Crusoe does not look at nature and human as in kind of synergic with each other. It's, it's a motive of domination that is, that is present. Of course, we also have, as it were, the myth of the homo economicus in the way that Robinson Crusoe is the economic man, builds up a basic economy starting with tools, human labor. And remember Marx talking about, you know, uh, not taking cognizance of Robinson Crusoe's uh, religious musings. He suggests that the only way of approaching Robinson Crusoe is to look at it as a validation of human labor. So the myth of the homo economicus and of labor. And finally, of course, the Ur myth of Western colonialism. Right. If you see uh, the, the slide there, you'll find that the Robinson age takes great impetus in the 19th century also. You have 1812, the Swiss family Robinson. Of course, many of you will be familiar with Ballantine's The Coral Island, where a group of boys are marooned on an island. This is 1857. But let's take a look at how the 18th and 19th century frames Robinson Crusoe in terms of the images. Now, if you take a look at the left-hand side of mice, uh, or the right-hand side what will it be? I, I, I don't know. But this is the first illustration of Robinson Crusoe, really. The 1719 frontispiece. You see Crusoe with, their, with the phallic guns, with the ship in the background, and the foregrounding of the man with his weapons and his tools, which will make him great. If you look at a more uh, later 18th century engraving, you will find the tale of the colonizer Crusoe, Friday kneeling before Robinson Crusoe, and Crusoe, you know, the Christian colonizer, you know, almost putting his feet on <coughs> Friday's head. So that's the theme of colonization. So from, we've moved on from Western man's tool and enterprise to Western man's domination and colonialism. And if we take a look at that 1877 portrait of Robinson Crusoe, you'll find that the theme is now almost like that of David, using <coughs> Robinson Crusoe as a kind of the energetic masculine Western civilization ruling the globe with, you know, the ball in its hand, as it were. So, for the 19th century, Crusoe was the archetype of Western man civilization, his dominion, his enterprise, his colonials. Now, this changes substantially with the 
texts of the 20th century. The first text I discuss very briefly, of course, uh, given the paucity of time, is Lord of the Flies, William Golding, uh, you know, 1954. And Golding is in many ways writing against a Robinson. So here we have the case of a Robins, of a myth of Robinson Crusoe generating Ballantine's Robinson, Inc., which celebrates a group of three English boys landing on an island and surviving there, kind of Boy Scout narrative. And then we have Golding reversing this Robinson aid in an anti-Robinson aid. Remember, this is written just after World War II. And therefore, you have a group of public educated Englishmen landing uh, English boys marooned on an island. There are four major characters here. Ralph, who represents the leader who is unwilling in the shape of Chamberlain, representing America and England of the Second World War, dilly-dallying with Hitler's motives. We have Jack, the cruel, aggressive, masculine prototype of Hitler, who identifies, you know, who feeds upon the paranoia of people. We have Simon, the gentle boy who is the Christ-like figure who's killed. And we have Piggy again, the voice of rationality and the voice of scientific, of science, who's also butchered on this particular island. Now, <clears throat> of course, Golding foregrounds a rather dystopic version of childhood. You know, he destroys our concept of childhood innocence with the concept of childhood aggression and cruelty, and therefore comments on the pervasive Hobbesian idea of human life as nasty, brutish, and short, creating an anti robinsonate of the 20th century with the Second World War in the background. You have, of course, this quotation from Goldie, you know, where he uses this very Hobbesian paradigm of the boys suffering from the terrible disease, as it were, of being human. So in a certain sense, just after the Second World War, and we've seen the shadow of the First World War also, Golding strips away, as it were, the veneer of humanity and suggests through his anti robinson aid the beastly quality of both human beings, adult or children. So that's one of the first major Robinson aids that uh, I use here in the 20th century. And now I come to a very interesting text. This is Michael Tourney's Friday on the Other Island, 1967. This is a text which starts off with the premise of the original Robinson Crusoe myth. You have Crusoe dominating Friday. But then, it's very interestingly, you know, Crusoe and Friday develop a bond, and the novel is then flipped, as it were, looking at the Crusoe myth from Friday's perspectives. Interestingly, once Crusoe takes a step back and starts looking at the island from Friday's perspective, he sees a newer bond between the, the island, that is nature, and the human a bond which is far more synergic, far more emotional, and at times deeply sexual. In that sense that Crusoe goes to a scave, cave, and this island is titled Speranza, which means hope. And in the cave, Crusoe is seen as copulating with nature and producing mandrakes, which are the offspring of, of uh, the man-human, as it were, uh, closer sexual interaction. In that sense, this is a text that deeply challenges our ontological awareness, how our consciousness, as it were, or how our knowledge systems are permeated through the idea of nature. So, you know, if you take a look at that passage, for example, as an example of what I'm trying to suggest, a warm breath set the leaves stirring. He 
He pictured his own lungs growing outside himself like the blossoming of purple tinted flesh, living polyparies of coral with pink membranes. So it's a kind of internalizing and feeling nature rather than merely seeing it as an external reality. So in a sense, therefore, the island is no longer a non-human entity. It alters his face and body, modes of thinking, perception of things. And that's why I'm saying that this is a profound ontological challenge to the idea of Crusoe. And therefore, it in many ways, is the first, as it were, eco-critical variation of the Robinson Crusoe myth, where the Anthropocene is, as it were, reversed, and a new relationship between the man and the environment, taking Friday as a mediator, is kind of a derived. So in a way, it questions both colonialism and the anthropocentrism that is embedded within Robinson Crusoe. Now, let me come to the next and the probably the most famous rereading of Robinson Crusoe, Katsia's Four. This is a 1986 novel, which starts off with the premise that a young woman called Susan Barton is shipwrecked again and marooned on Crusoe's island. And she's lost her daughter and she comes and finds a decrepit Crusoe who's, you know, aged, who cannot do anything. And everything, on the other hand, is done by Friday, whose tongue has been cut off. Right. And after their brief stay on the island, where Barton tries to come to terms with Friday, they leave the island. And they and on the, en route, Crusoe dies. So Barton then writes her own manuscript, which she brings to England and shares with D. Foe, Mr. Foe. Remember, Daniel D. Foe was Daniel Foe earlier. And Foe, instead of publishing Susan Barton's experience, erases the woman out of the narrative altogether and creates it as a kind of a patriarchal fantasy of the man on the island dominating Friday. So in a sense, you know, this is a metafictional text that introduces Defoe as the character and problematizes the politics of fiction writing in itself, drawing upon the linkages of language and power, the idea that those without voices cease to signify figuratively and literally. Right, a question that subsequently later all of us know, Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak would ask, you know, who speaks for whom? Can the subaltern speak? And therefore, you know, much as Koitsi would like, Katsia would like to, you know, retain or sort of bring out, excavate the voices of the marginalized, is asking a very important question. Susan Barton tries to empathize with Friday, given that both of them are erased, both of them are marginalized, but Friday does not communicate. It's a question of, you know, multiple identities, not only gender, but also of class, race, and therefore the difficulties of communication and, you know, fiction writing itself. It's a very important question that, you know, Koji once asked, can the leopard change its spots? Can a white woman therefore excavate the angst that the the tongue cut off Friday can feel. So these problems of representability, the problems of representation, as it were, are foregrounded in this particular text, a text which I think is one of Crusoe's, I'm sorry, one of Kadzia's finest in terms of language, power, and representability. Right. If this are the major, these are the major Robinson aids in literature, then let me now quickly move over to another genre altogether. And you see, for the cinematic medium with the barren island, the adventures, the kind of dramatic tensions of finding the footprint, the interaction and the violence with Friday, Robinson Crusoe provided a very fertile kind of a text which could be adapted into films. 
And we see Edward Sutherland, Mr. Robinson Crusoe, 1700, I'm sorry, 1932. Now, an archetypal Robinson Aid where, you see, the character is named Drexel, not, not Crusoe, by the way. And he takes on the challenge of transforming an island into New York. And therefore jumps off from a ship and decides to voluntarily stay on the island. Now, with rudimentary technology, he sort of creates various kinds of machines which can excavate fruits, which can uh, sort of milk the cows and the goats and fight with the local inhabitants of the island. Therefore, you know, in a certain sense, it embodies the American dream of the early 20th century of transforming every single territory into a mini America, as it were, the industrial Realization and a dream of the American, you know, resource hunting, as it were. In the process, of course, you know, Drexel comes across Friday, whom he defeats without any effort at all. And Saturday, a young woman whom for whom who is attracted to her, to him rather, but whom he cannot sort of have any kind of relationship with because of the idea of racial segregation and miscegenation that were prevalent in contemporary times. So Saturday, this young woman who is in love with Drexel is brought to America and exhibited as a kind of a freak, as it were. So in that sense, you know, the perversity of the Western imagination, the kind of uh, obsession with transforming uh, every single island into a representation of the American dream, opportunity, hunting, capitalism. These are welded into Sutherland's film. Now, Bunuel, of course, was a much more serious filmmaker. Seven, 1952, Robinson Crusoe. This is a text which is very, very, uh, as it were, faithful to the original. You know, I show this to my students when they read Robinson Crusoe to give them an almost exact idea of what happens. But Bunuel, remember, is writing post-existentialism. And therefore, what Bunuel does in the text is also repeatedly question the idea of God and his existence. And therefore, deconstruct the meta-narrative of religion, as it were. There's a very important scene in the movie where Crusoe actually sort of shouts out to the hills and asks, art thou there? And the hills, you know, reverberate back with the empty echoes, there, 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 and so on and so forth. So in that sense, Bunuel is weaving into Robinson Crusoe uh, a very major theme of the existential crisis that was confronting humanity at that particular point of time. Now, let me move on to a next text. And I have these texts all included, but uh, I have my time quite restricted. So I'd like to talk about a 1997 version of Rob Hardy and George Miller's Robinson Crusoe, as I pointed out. And you can see in the picture there, it's Pierce Brosnan, who is the Robinson Crusoe. And this is an interestingly politically correct film. You see here, the Friday asks, you know, why have you made me call yourself master? Therefore, the political equations of colonialism are interrogated very, very frequently in this particular text. So it from the from the adventure narrative, this then moves into a political interrogation of the post-colonial crusade. Although at the close, you know. It reverts back to its Hollywood paradigm where Crusoe and, uh, and Friday have to fight each other in a kind of a tribal hamlet. And Crusoe sacrifices himself rather than he wants to sacrifice himself like Christ rather than killing Friday. Friday is, of course, killed then by the colonizers who arrive and shoot him. And Crusoe weeps for his friend. So this provides a, a new kind of a political equation of the post-colonial times where Crusoe and 
Friday can be reconciled rather than in a power relationship. An interesting uh, film, which many of you might have seen, is Cast Away. And Cast Away is a film that created waves in the sense that it reinvented the, the Crusoe story in the sense that Crusoe here is on the island with a baseball rather than any, any, uh, any other human being. And the angst of, of the character here uh, sort of interrogates the very premises through which capitalism operates in Robinson Crusoe. So these are in a, in a very, very brief kind of a overview of the ways in which the Robinsonate has functioned within the 20th century. Now, let me therefore move on to my conclusions. The first and foremost is the Crusoes in the 20th century, unlike the 18th century and the 19th, do not create anything that whereas the 18th century and the 19th century depended on the archetypal Robinsonate, the 20th century deconstructs the ideological premises of the Robinson Crusoe myth and therefore, you know, create dystopias and deconstruct the ideologies rather than construct the colonial paradigms. The 20th century rewritings are primarily anti robinsonades They present a grim vision of humanity mediated through the two world wars, mediated through the, you know, pulverizing of the environment and the colonial expansions. The 19th century Robinson Age, remember, were primarily directed at children, the future colonists of Britain. And that is where you see, you know, why Robinson Crusoe becomes an old text for children, because subconsciously Western children were, you know, uh, familiarized with the idea of domination, of exploitation, and of colonization. Therefore, this is where Robinson Crusoe becomes children's narrative in the 19th century, imperial policy and the dream of empire. But with the 20th century, you know, with the world war, with the consequences of colonialism and nationalism, we see a movement away towards the dystopic possibilities of uh, the Robinson Crusoe myth. With the development of feminist theory, the rise of the feminist electorate, representation, therefore a new direction is thrust where the eraser of the of the woman's voice and the patriarchal assumptions of the text become foregrounded women playing centralized roles. The post-colonial era, on the other hand, post-1950s, tries to recapture the voice of Friday, right, in the sense that, you know, uh, it sort of demystifies the colonial voice and tries to create a, a more harmonious relationship between Crusoe and Friday based on equality, uh, debunk the myth of European cultural superiority. And finally, also, you know, it talks about the uh, revision of the way in which the man environment relationship would be prefigured or would be uh, represented through the texts. Now, as this is something of a research that's uh, that's I'm really fiddling with, and I'm, I'm still not through with this. So I put this as the last slide, as it were. This is how Robinson Crusoe, by the way, one of the later uh, adventures of Robinson Crusoe is based in India. He's shipwrecked in India and marooned on the southern coast, incidentally, where you know there is the East India Company, which is referred to. Defoe, of course, does not play on this much. But I was looking at some of the first English texts that were being published in Kolkata and distributed across India. And I found that Robinson Crusoe was one of the major texts, one of the first texts, incidentally. So how did the Indians write back? Now, I have with me one text which I talk about, and that is a text written by Premendra Mitra, who was one of the leading Bengali writers of the 1940s. Was writing a series of tall tales called the Ghanada tales, and you can see Ghanada's, you know, as it were, portrayal here of the uh, the uh, the slim, uh, underfed Bengali, as it were, who who sort of is restricted within his locus, but has his imagination to travel all across the globe and spin all kinds of 
yawns. So he creates a tale where, you know, the Robinson Crusoe text is based actually in China, where a Chinese woman is sold as a kind of a bride in exchange for political peace. And on the way, she is supposed to elope with a warlord. They're caught in a storm. The warlord is, as it were, captured. And she flees on a boat and waits for her lover. Now, the tale then meanders across, you know, 200 years where she waits for this man. And when she sees him coming, she bounds down the hill to meet him. And she sees a cruel, you know, image of his descendants who've actually come to exploit the land. And several other descendants are, you know, descending upon this island to ravish her as well as the island. So instead of, you know, a tale of survival, we have a tale of everlasting love, as it were, which is confronted by the newer realities of the colonial man trying to, you know, or the capitalist man trying to ravish territory. And at that point of time, all her beauty vanishes and she becomes an aged old woman who collapses on the, the island. And then Ghanada says, you know, what would that mer merchant Defo understand of such texts? He has just taken this text and transformed it into a tale of survival and shipwreck of a man. So as early as 1953 then, Premendra Mitra, writing in England, India, is reimagining the Robinson Aid and talking about Robinson Crusoe as being a woman. The Bengali title is Robinson Crusoe, May Chilen, Crusoe was a woman and trying to understand the power implications in the man-woman relationship, talking about eternal love and the pre-colonial concept of love versus, as it were, a more capitalist notion of the body of the woman and the body of the island, which are conflated into one. So that is one of the Robinsonades that I've been able to discover in India. I'm hunting for more texts. If you do have any clues, do let me know so that I can follow up uh, the, the trajectory of Robinson Crusoe in the Indian languages. This is uh, a newer research that is taking me in a different direction, but I thought I should share this with you. So that has been the trajectory of the Robinsonade in Western, uh, across the Western continents, as it were. And uh, that is where I see the Robinsonade sort of interrogating and repeatedly questioning the idea of, uh, of uh, the, the ideological implications and engaging in a process of intertextuality. Now, I teach Robinson Crusoe in my, uh, in my undergraduate course. If you would like to take a look at the lectures, you have the YouTube link there. All my lectures are on YouTube. So, uh, you know, you can take this forward also. Thank you very much for your very patient hearing. And I thank the organizers for providing me the space with which to interact. With you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for enlightening us with such an insightful interpretation of the much read text. I'm very sure that the audience have enjoyed a lot in your session. So now I would like uh, to uh, take up the question answer session. So, sir, may I start with a question yes. answer? Of course, okay. of course. All right. So the first question is from Professor Ramani PN. Uh, Professor Ramani asks, in what sense would you consider colonialism a myth? Was it not a historical fact? No, I'm not okay. talking about colonialism as a myth. I'm talking about Robinson Crusoe as a myth of colonialism. You see, what are myths? They are archetypal stories of how a certain ideology operates. You see, Robinson Crusoe is a myth of colonialism primarily because of five reasons. One, Crusoe arrives on the island, sees it as a barren territory and claims it as his. 
I am the Lord and master of all that I serve. The island belongs, of course, to Friday and the local inhabitants. One. Secondly, not only does he see Friday as a subject, but also the entire nature. So all the resources of the available territory are for Crusoe to plunder, which, of course, is another dominant characteristic of colonialism. Third is the way in which Crusoe tames Friday with his gun and violently kills his comrades. Of course, again, remember that you know, Friday and his ilk have to be cannibals so that they can be civilized by Crusoe. Four, there's a process of erasure through which, you know, the colonial, the, the myth, the colonialism operates. Eraser of language, eraser of identity is named Friday. His language is erased and his God is also erased. So we have not only, you know, the way in which you know, there is a transformation of the colonized altogether, but a very definite program of erasure where Crusoe embodies within himself the political colonizer as well as the religious colonizer, the missionary also. It is in this sense that I'm saying that Crusoe, or Robinson Crusoe, is a myth of colonialism. I have never argued, I will, that is not possible for me to argue that colonialism is. Right. But the story of colonialism is one which is probably embodied with great and succinct penetration in Robinson Crusoe. So that's what I meant. Thank you so much, sir, for answering the question. We have got pretty nice questions in the line. So my next question uh, I would read out is from Dr. Vinod K. Chopra. Sir writes, could you please mention some Indian writings that qualify as Robinsonate? Yes, that, that is what I'm trying to find out. You see, uh, you know, uh, one of the texts that I've been able to find out is an Armenian translation of Robinson Crusoe, uh, which interestingly was written from Chennai. But because it is written in the Armenian you know, language, as it were, I haven't been able to decipher it as yet. This is a pretty long, lengthy text. There were several translations of Robinson Crusoe in Bangla. Interestingly, one done by uh, a very well-known uh, Bengali literature for children called Leela Majumdar, which I've accessed from the National Library. I accessed a text which I was referring to, Premendra Mitra writing uh, Robinson Crusoe, May Chilen. There's one film which I think talks about the Robinson Crusoe myth which uh, I remember is this this gentleman who uh, was in Bheja Fry. I, I forget the name, but there is this uh, this kind of uh, Robinsonade which is worked into that film. I haven't really critically taken a look at it. And therefore, I'm take, trying to look at, you know, if there are regional versions of Robinson Crusoe translated into uh, various Indian languages. If any of you can enlighten me with it, of course, I would be very grateful because you see, almost every in almost every language, Robinson Crusoe has been translated. Whether there is a Robinsonade in the language is something that I'm looking at. This is this is just a, a point where my research has started. Maybe when I've sort of looked more into it, I, I've looked at the Bangla writings. Uh, if I can trace a few more you know, uh, Indian rewritings, I would be able to answer it better. Thank you for that question. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you, Mr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Chopra for such a question. Okay, so the next question is from Dr. Deep Praveen Sam. Uh, sir asks, in spite of such a lot of information and research on the idea that humans and the nature are closely connected why man is continuously trying to disturb or damage nature in the name of development? Over to you, sir. Well, that, that is a philosophical question, as it were. This was, you know, yesterday I was, I was listening to a, a sort of a lecture by the very well-known post-humanist critic, K. Catherine Hales. And Catherine Hales was sort of uh, uh, referring to uh, two issues is... Uh, one, we 
we have more or less now recognized what you know nature can do to us if we disturb it too much and we have been disturbing it from the say age of the anthropocene and you know praveen i know is responding from chennai which has seen incredible floods we in calcutta are submerged even now uh, and as amitabh ghosh has pointed out you know in the great derangement many of the coastal cities are in threat of being you know inundated but there are two things one is that we have grown used to certain comforts creature comforts which we cannot deny ourselves now as you will find that one of the things that propelled the the environmental destruction was coal and we are gradually cutting off on coal and therefore you know you have a new kind of a currency called carbon currency where you know your credit goes up once you reduce your carbon footprint but also there is this question of why me you know the west thinks that if it loses its you know carbon emissions or its uh, use and depletion of natural resources then it loses out to the to china and the third world war at uh, the third world and third world is within quotes by the way right that's a perception and on the other hand of course on this side we think that well if the west has you know put in its carbon footprint why should we lose out on development so that old debate you know between development and as it were uh, you know environment has given this hybrid idea of sustainable development but the human is a species that i think Uh, understands a little late and maybe just maybe we are trying to wake up to the idea that such a, a a kind of a sort of destruction of the environment is reaching at a point where you know we cannot reverse it just think about how many of us you know do not use the air conditioner knowing very well that the air conditioner is one of the major reasons for pollution in our uh, or carbon emissions so you know one has to balance these issues i guess thank you sir ma uh, the next question is from ms uh, momita de roy ms roy writes do you think robinsonate is a bigger and more dominating reality especially political than anti robinsonate i'm sorry could you repeat that question yes sir Uh, do you think robinsonate is a bigger and more dominating reality especially political than anti robinsonate look uh, you know while i've been talking about the western kind of idea of the robinsonate you see the robinsonate in in a certain way looks at the implications of the robinson crusoe story and you see the robinson crusoe story if you ask me philosophically goes back to an idea which was popularized by hobbes that hobbes said that all of us seek power recognition and therefore when these are scarce we will try to always dominate the other and therefore human life as it were he saw was one of continuous conflict leading to an insecurity and generating more conflict the hobbes's idea in leviathan is that human existence is nasty brutish and short now in that sense robinson crusoe in many fundamental ways creates this obsian dystopia that whoever has power will engage in this process of dominion and conflict take a look for example at china today in china is the new robinson crusoe is trying to colonize a different territory and occupy it altogether it's just replicating the ways in which the west has acted in many ways and therefore what i would like to suggest is that the robinsonade is a very powerful ideology the robin uh, i'm sorry the robinson crusoe story it's not a story at all it's a paradigm of human behavior and therefore the anti robinsonate becomes very vital in understanding how we can resist the robinson 
uh, Crusoe story as it were. So in that sense, when we you know, talk about more powerful, less powerful, we're falling into that you know, trap of power which the Robinson Crusoe story actually brings to us. You know, when you tell you the Robinson Crusoe story to your children or, you know, younger adults who are in with you in your rooms, therefore, revise the Robinson Crusoe story a bit. Talk about how Robinson Crusoe is not the ideal that uh, one needs to aspire to. So I will probably answer that question with the answer that I don't want to be drawn into the question of uh, power relations, which is more powerful. I just say that the anti robinson aid is necessary for understanding at every level how you know uh, texts can be deconstructed and reconstructed and you know uh, and how you know this process of intertextuality is a very vital process in today's world thank you so much sir so uh, one last question i would like to pass over it is by Miss Sangeeta Jolly. She asks, what is the myth behind Western civilization in the 19th century? What is the myth behind Western civilization in the 19th century? Over to you, sir. Right. The myth behind Western civilization, the most dominant myth of the, of the Western civilization in the 19th century stems from the idea of enlightenment that the 18th century promulgated. You see, if I take a look at the 18th century, who are the major philosophers here? One, René Descartes, 1670, Discourse on Method. Locke, the idea of the human understanding, that is 1690, leading up to uh, people like, say, Adam Smith, the theory of, you know, the, the wealth of nations, which is one of the fundamental texts of capitalism. So between them, what Descartes is doing is presenting the first and foremost idea of Western man is that is rationality is the only pathway to knowledge. Second, lock epistemology in the sense that induction is the way to knowledge. Again, the discourse of reason. Secondly, you have the discourse of reason coming into contact with the capitalist ideology to create this myth of what McPherson calls possessive individualism. Now, if this possessive individualism is held as the dominant trait of Western civilization in the late uh, 18th century, then towards the early half of the 19th century, this is once again, you know, from the 18th century onwards, of course, this taken over by colonialism and, of course, again, by a very, very strong strong sense of patriarchal capitalism. So between the three, colonialism, reason, and progress, and patriarchy, I see these are the ways through, and capitalism, these are the way which constitute the fundamental fabric of what the 19th century individual is going to be like. And then comes in the idea of utilitarian that you know once again adds another dimension to the articulation of the capitalist narrative so if you ask me philosophically and politically i would say that the western self is constituted fundamentally in the 19th century early 19th century by these uh, discourses as it were and they are profoundly challenged once you have the moment of modernism where all these discourses are fundamentally taken apart one by one. Thank you so much, sir. So it was indeed a very, very insightful session. And I would like to thank Dr. Sen along with our audience. Uh, there are so many you know, insightful questions as well uh, and praises like a wonderful session, very informative, sir, and also some other questions. So uh, we shall be delivering the questions to sir definitely and uh, sir will answer it later on. So now I would like to pass the beacon to Dr. Praveen Sam. Over to you, sir. May I, Praveen, for a moment, may I just thank all the participants for listening in and for these wonderful questions that you have posted. Thank you very much.
uh, thank you sir thank you for this wonderful session and moderators thank you for brilliantly moderating the session uh, dear uh, audience Uh, so can you all uh, switch off our camel mic so that people can see the slide? Thank you. Uh, dear participants, uh, the next week's webinar is titled Differentiated Instruction, Why and How. The resource person of this session will be Ms. Meena Sridharan. She's a consultant trainer. And session is moderated by Ms. Ranjani Shankar, uh, ELT professional, uh, Ms. Mr. Susai Ratnam, a teacher educator. So I uh, request the participants to enroll in this session as well and uh, get enlightened. The next information is about our uh, 15th international conference and the 51st annual conference of LTI, which is happening on two weekends. That is 28th and 21st and 27th and 28th of November. Uh, you have four more days to uh, uh, I mean, send in your abstracts and register. I request the participants to uh, make use of this opportunity and uh, again get enlightened. Uh, this is our website. Uh, you can uh, log on to this website and check uh, the details uh, of the conference, like important dates and where to send abstracts and so on. Uh, so with this, uh, thank you all for listening throughout the session and making us proud. Thank you so much.